Good afternoon. I'm Matthew Kranig, Acting Director of the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event titled, How Can We Deter China in the 2020s? A Conversation with Michelle Flournoy. This event is part of our Forward Defense Forum, generously supported by Lockheed Martin, which is designed for defense visionaries to put forth novel ideas for how the United States, its allies and partners, can adapt, innovate, and win on the future battlefield. Today's discussion features a fireside chat with former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Michelle Flournoy. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to your insights over the next hour. Here at the Atlantic Council, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important national security challenges facing the United States and its allies. We also honor the legacy of General Brent Scowcroft, uh, his uh, ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. Consistent with that mission, the Center's forward defense practice is designed to shape the debate around the greatest military and defense challenges facing the United States and its allies, and create forward-looking assessments of the trends, technologies, and concepts that will define the future of warfare. Today's event will consider how uh, U.S. and allied militaries can meet the urgency of the China challenge. China's continued threats to Taiwan test the viability of U.S. deterrence, uh, and in the near term, Recently, U.S. intelligence leaders reported that Chinese President Xi Jinping has ordered the People's Liberation Army to develop the capabilities necessary to uh, conquer Taiwan by 2027. Uh, if China acts, are U.S. and allied militaries prepared to defend Taiwan? Uh, today's event will explore the warfighting concepts and investments needed to deter adversarial aggression in the near term. Uh, we couldn't be more pleased to welcome our guests. Uh, as I said, we're honored to be joined by Michelle Flournoy, Michelle served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2009 to 2012. Uh, in this role, she was the principal uh, policy advisor to the Secretary of Defense. Um, also during that uh, period, I had the privilege of working uh, for Michelle for a brief period. Uh, she currently serves as the co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors, a strategic advisory firm offering geopolitical and uh, policy expertise. Michelle is also a commissioner of the Atlantic Council's Defense Innovation Adoption Commission, which we set up to spur a new approach to defense innovation. Uh, moderating this conversation is Clementine Starling, the deputy director of the Scowcroft Center's Forward Defense Practice. Uh, before we hear from Michelle and Clementine, however, I have the honor of introducing Tim Cahill. Uh, Tim is the senior vice president of global business development and strategy at Lockheed Martin. Uh, he'll provide his perspective on the significance of this discussion. He formerly served as Senior Vice President for Lockheed Martin International and as Vice President for Lockheed Martin Missiles and Fire Control, managing numerous uh, emerging integrated air and missile defense systems. Before I turn it over to Tim, a couple of housekeeping notes. I'd like to remind everyone that this event is public and on the record. Uh, we encourage our online audience to direct questions to Michelle using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to identify yourself and your affiliation uh, when asking your question. We'll collect your questions throughout the event, and Clementine will pose uh, many of them to our guest. We also encourage our online audience to join the conversation on Twitter, following at AC Scowcroft, and using the hashtag Forward Defense. Uh, thank you all for joining the Atlantic Council for what I know will be a captivating conversation. And uh, Tim, without further ado, over to you. Matt, thank you, and thank you for your leadership here at the Atlantic Council and for our opportunity to partner with you to present the Forward Defense Forum. Today's discussion is part of a year-long project with the Atlantic Council to deliver discussions, analysis, and strategic writing that addresses some of the most critical challenges of the day. A key role of mine at Lockheed Martin is to better understand the needs of our allies and partners across the globe. To this end, I spend significant time traveling around the world and hear many of the challenges faced by our partners abroad. Today's discussion comes at a particularly important time for the regional, European, and transatlantic security given the ongoing war in Ukraine. The events in Ukraine serve as a stark reminder of the importance of the transatlantic alliance and the value of the important work done here at the Atlantic Council. And while the events in Ukraine capture today's headlines, 
looming in the backdrop of our geopolitical environment is what the Department of Defense refers to as the pacing challenge which requires a connected, resilient, joint force and defense ecosystem. The role of industry in supporting America's national defense strategy and the integrated deterrence necessary to defend and deter requires unprecedented urgency and agility. I am looking forward to the dialogue today. So you have heard uh, Matt talk through Michelle Flournoy, Flournoy's distinguished resume. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Clementine to facilitate today's discussions. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you all today. And I'm so thrilled um, to welcome um, Secretary Flournoy. Um, Ma'am, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, I wanted to kind of really kick off um, by asking a number of different questions. So that the theme of, of today's um, event is really focused on how do we enhance US deterrence um, and defense capabilities to deter China in the short term and the long term. Um, and we've heard um, CI Deputy Director um, David Cohen report recently um, that Xi Jinping has directed the PLA to be ready to take Taiwan by 2027. Um, so a lot of what we've been um, preparing for in the US is, is really kind of deterrence in the 2030s. So this 2027 kind of time frame is obviously a lot kind of shorter than, um, than we've been really preparing for. Um, so obviously no one can predict when we are likely to see conflict um, in the Indo-Pacific and hopefully we won't. Um, but I did want to, to talk to you about this time frame question and the urgency of deterring China. Um, it really begs the question, you know, is the US prepared today to deter China? Are our allies? And, and if not, how, how do we improve deterrence? Well, uh, it's so great to be with you today. Thank you for hosting this discussion. So the, I think the urgency um, around deterring China's aggression against Taiwan has really been heightened recently for a number of reasons. I think it, it's important to note that Xi Jinping would prefer to reunify Taiwan with the mainland with using non-military means. He'd, he'd prefer not to risk a war with the United States. He'd prefer to use political coercion, economic envelopment, other means of pressure. And for the moment, you know, he certainly has his hands full, full with the COVID crisis that, you know, his failed COVID policy, frankly, economic downturn in China, which has slowed the growth of the economy, which is all, always a very threatening thing for the Chinese Communist Party. He's got the 20th Party Congress coming up, which is a moment for consolidating his power and putting new uh, people in, in place around him. So, you know, I think, you know, this is not something he's focused on at the moment, but I do think that the Chinese aggressive overreaction to to the Pelosi visit, um, their uh, basically open rehearsal of a blockade of Taiwan, um, their use of the crisis to set a new normal of a much, much more aggressive posture of constantly violating Taiwanese airspace coming across the median line and the Taiwan Strait and so forth, that all of that is you know, a little bit of a, sh a warning shot for us to wake us up. And then you noted um, that he seems to have now directed the PLA to be ready by 2027. And we've seen him uh, call to accelerate the development and fielding of a number of uh, critical systems, uh, particularly longer range uh, munitions. And so I think um, it's possible that she, seeing our investments focused on the 2030s, could say, well, you know, yes, I'd prefer to resolve this without resort to force, but if I have to use force, maybe there's a window where it's better to use force before the Americans and their allies have fully set the region with the right posture and capability mix, um, because that would, you know, I'll have a better chance of success sooner than, than later. And so that, I think that sense, that's what's really contributed to this greater sense of urgency um, and, and dealing with that nearer term prospect requires a set of actions that are somewhat different than what the Pentagon is focused on um, and different and, and, and sort of fall into a gap or a seam between the longer term preparations of the service chiefs uh, and the services 
and the very near-term operational focus of the combatant commands. But if you look at the two to five or two to seven year window, um, there's no one in charge of that window. Um, and so that's where I think we need to focus and really ask ourselves, what can we do in that window to meaningfully enhance deterrence so that we, we undermine Xi's confidence in using force and we avoid the conflict if at all possible. Yeah, so I, I want to talk, spend quite a bit of the conversation talking about how we can accelerate innovation within the US to, to meet that challenge. Um, but before, before we dig into that, I did want to ask, you, you talked about the acceleration in military modernization that we're seeing um, in China at the moment. And China invested $225 billion on military modernization in 2022 alone, which is an uptick of 7.3% on 2021 spending. Um, so what are the capabilities, the force structure changes that we're seeing in China that most worry you? And, and what um, could those changes potentially indicate um, for suggesting what a kind of more likely scenario in Taiwan might look like? I think there are a couple of categories. One is um, this most recent directive to accelerate the development of longer range systems. The, the Chinese are trying to develop a set of capabilities that can really hold U.S. forces at risk, not only in the first island chain, but in, and even to the second island change, but even maybe beyond. And so trying to push out um, the threat ring, if you will, and so therefore uh, push out, uh, have force US forces to be based at longer ranges, um, to operate in a, a larger contested environment, to be at risk, you know, at much greater ranges than, than has previous been the case. Uh, so I think that that that's one thing. The other is anti-ship um, and so anti-submarine warfare. I mean, th this is a, a maritime environment, um, one of the most critical elements of our force structure in responding to a Taiwan crisis will be um, our naval forces. And um, the fact that the Chinese are doubling down on um, capabilities that will try to Either you know hold those risks, hold those forces at risk kinetically, or disrupt their operations through electronic warfare, cyber, and so forth. Um, I think those are areas where um, that you know that are that are troubling, and we need to develop some responses to. We have. I don't mean to suggest we have, we have lots of responses, but we need to uh, yeah, enhance our uh, toolkit. Um, so you've talked about the significant challenge, but also, you know, the necessity for the Department of Defense to really dramatically accelerate and scale the fielding of new capabilities. Um, but we all know that kind of there are systemic challenges um, that exist to, to, you know, the rapid acceleration. The U.S. budget and acquisition system is obviously set up um, you know, to design and build and, and really deploy these systems over decades, not years. Um, so this kind of time frame um, question that, that we're coming to, I mean, how can the US um, accelerate the development and adoption of new technologies and the concepts really needed in, in the short term? I think there are there are sort of three key things that we need to do. One is it's sort of the Apollo 13 problem of, you know, Houston, we have a problem and they focused on what do we have in hand that we could use in new ways to address the operational problems that we're having. I think we need to have that kind of effort on an urgent basis where we look at not, not buying new things, but mainly how do you take existing munitions, put them on different platforms, augment them with some additional capability, use them in a new way that gets a new result. That's really the sort of, um, it's more about um, creative thinking and putting things together in new ways and new operational concepts to get a different outcome. Um, that, that's, th that's bucket one. Bucket two is leveraging commercial systems and accelerating our and scaling our adoption of um, innovative commercial systems. These are off the shelf. We don't need to spend years writing a military requirement 
and then more years um, putting out a bid and more years procuring them, we can take these systems, for example, commercial drone swarms, um, figure out how to integrate them into our own existing military capabilities in a way that dramatically complicates Chinese attack planning and would dramatically reduce their effectiveness. Um, and then the third is there are lots of things we have in production. We need to do a survey and take a look. Is there anything that we, if with more resources and more focus, we could actually accelerate the fielding timelines or accelerate the scaling of production? Um, there may be some uh, systems in the, that basket as well. So this is something we need to do comprehensively and sort of pull out all the stops to see to see what's possible. So, so you've reflected on the, you know, a range of different um, things that, that we could be pursuing. And, and I know that you've written recently in Foreign Affairs about this. Um, you've really reflected in the past on the, on the value of, of dual use technology. And, you know, looking at the war in Ukraine, we've seen the, the heavy reliance on dual, dual use technology, um, you know, such as commercial satellites, autonomous um, drones, even kind of cellular communications having a really significant impact on the battlefield. Um, so as, as we think about um, what Taiwan needs in terms of modernization and enhancing its self-defense capabilities, is the answer kind of more of an emphasis on these dual use capabilities? But, and how do we integrate that with kind of more exquisite capabilities that Taiwan and, and others need also? Yeah, I think it's a mix. I mean, they they I think the first thing is Taiwan needs a you know multi-layered defense plan that really leverages asymmetric approaches. Um, they're never going to match um, the quantity and just the sheer mass of Chinese capabilities, but they can certainly make themselves more of a porcupine and and really challenge the Chinese um, uh, plans and also buy, buy time. The critical thing is buying time for um, the international community to respond. So things like sea mines, things like anti-ship and anti-submarine uh, weapons, things like uh, drones that can complicate uh, uh, the execution of operations. Um, things like mobile air and missile defenses. Um, you know, the list goes on and there's been a good amount written about this. Some of that, most of that is gonna be defense hardware. Some of it could be augmented with readily available commercial technologies. Um, and the key though is marrying that together with uh, new operational concepts and training and exercising so they really this is fully baked into the DNA of the Taiwanese military. You know, one of the things that people forget is that in the, the seven years uh, between Crimea and the Russian invasion in February, um, NATO members uh, had intensive training and assisting efforts with Ukraine to help re, um, reorient their whole approach uh, to defending against Russia. And that those years of, of developing new concepts and training on them and exercising them is part of what has led to the success of Ukraine on the battlefield um, against most the expectations of most. So we need to be doing that kind of work with Taiwan that is just as important as the provision of the additional equipment they will need. Um, the one other thing I'll note that's a difference Ukraine has a very favorable geography in terms of bordering NATO frontline states and allowing us to have open supply lines in the midst of conflict. Taiwan is an island. It will be an island that is surrounded by you know, Chinese forces. We have to do a lot more upfront pre-crisis to stockpile, stockpile the, the systems they will need to fend off the Chinese and buy time, it, should it come to that. Um, and, and we can't expect to do that once a crisis has, has started. Um, so you've 
you've raised a few issues there that I, I'd love to uh, dig into, but I'd also really encourage um, our audience watching virtually to pl please um, submit your questions via Zoom, because um, we're reading through those, and I'd really like to like to pose some of them um, to Secretary Florinoy. Um, so just you, you talked about the security assistance efforts to Ukraine, and I think a, a lot of us, that there aren't tons of shiny examples of security assistance working really well, and maybe part of that is because we haven't really seen it challenged, um, tested. Um, but I think what experts have, have really drawn out from the Ukraine crisis is that a lot of the security assistance programs efforts of the US and, and European allies was really focused on building up the basics of Ukrainian military, like very much focusing on command and control, civil military relations, and less on the flashbang of kind of uh, you know, training in in um, in high tech systems, is that a lesson that we could be drawing and applying to the way we approach security assistance with Taiwan and other countries? Absolutely, I think training the people, developing the concepts, um, developing leadership down to the the field level, uh, robust command and control. Um, the ability to integrate intelligence and have intelligence-driven operations. These, these are the fundamentals, and um, you can have lots of shiny objects and, and an arsenal of all kinds of sophisticated equipment, but if you don't have a force that's really trained and ready to use, use, use that equipment, you're going to have poor results. Um, and I think um, this is an area where we absolutely need to focus with, with Taiwan. Um, so you, you also reflected a little bit, I think we've seen a lot of comparisons or people are posing questions of what, what have we learned from the Russia-Ukraine war? What are the assumptions that we went into the war expecting to see? Like, I think a lot of people expected to see a much more highly technological war, and, and in some respects this war has been not, not that. Um, what are some of the lessons that we are at risk of potentially overlearning or applying to different contexts and scenarios, like like in the Indo-Pacific, that perhaps don't apply? Well, I think um, you know, I think everybody was surprised at the degree of the poor performance of the Russian military, from failure to be able to conduct you know combined arms operations, failure to have strong leadership and command and control in the battlefield. Um, failure to be able to support their forces in the field with logistics and sustainment. Um, you know, the list, the list goes on. And, you know, that, and, 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 you know, I think there's a temptation because the Chinese military um, is untested from a combat perspective to sort of say, well, maybe, maybe they're just, just as feckless as the Russian forces were. Um, I think that would be a mistake. Um, you know, I don't think we should say they're 10 feet tall, um, but they have their own problems and their own challenges, and they are untested. But they've also made tremendous strides in the professionalization of the force, particularly over the last decade. And I don't think we should um, underestimate them. Um, I also think that another key lesson has been the strength of the Ukrainian resistance that I think surprised everyone. Um, particularly the Russians. Um, I think the Chinese have taken note of that, and they're now studying the question of, will the Taiwanese people resist? What if they did resist? What would that mean for our ability to actually, um, you know, take control of the island? Um, and I think it's an open question, and that that is um, something where, again, our assistance needs to not just be military equipment, but to the extent Taiwan needs to develop the organizational infrastructure to enable an effective resistance by the society and sort of plug that into a coherent national plan. Again, that's an area where I know they've asked for assistance and I'm, uh, I believe that the United States is um, providing some of that. But that's, that's another area we can't just assume that um, Another society would stand up uh, and resist in the, the in a way that is has been as effective as um, what's happened in Ukraine. Um, I think um, on on that point, uh, 
that the, the will of, of the people is a, is a very important part to um, resilience and, and any porcupine defense um, strategy or, or concept. Um, and so I think it's interesting as we reflect on kind of this time, time frame issue from the perspective of Xi Jinping, he has made very, very clear that reunifying China with Taiwan is, is a legacy issue. Um, but the longer, um, you know, generationally, um, the longer that things go on, I think you know, there is more of a trend within Taiwan to really not see, to see themselves as being very separate from China. So is there, a, how do you think Xi Jinping, I'm gonna ask you the impossible and impossible question, is thinking about the trade-off between letting so much time go by that perhaps there is less um, support within Taiwan for reunification as younger generations uh, become more and more focused on, on independence with the need to build up capabilities that, um, that the PLA would need in order to potentially um, you know, execute unification. Yeah, no, I, I think that this is a central challenge for Beijing that every year that goes by, there are fewer and fewer uh, members of Taiwanese society who have any interest in being part of the mainland. Um, and yet, you know, if, if uh, so I don't think the political and economic coercion measures that she is, uh, has used or may use in the future are likely to work. Um, the, which, it, and, and I do think that, you know, the use of force would be a huge gamble for Xi. Um, he would be putting his entire, you know, position of power on the line because, uh, you know, if, if in fact it's unprovoked aggression against Taiwan, the U.S. and its allies and respond, the international community condemns China, pushes back against China, sanctions China, um, you know, this could be a very costly and uncertain uh, and possibly failed effort by, by Xi. And so, um, you know, I, I do think that that argues for a different way of thinking about this. You know, can China um, think about allowing Taiwan to coexist in a different way for an indefinite period of time rather than trying to force its will on the island? Because I think that, again, the more time that goes by, um, the more um, resistance and, and the higher costs they're going to face um, in, in trying to force the issue. Um, so the Department of Defense kind of announced these 14 um, technological, critical technology areas for modernization. And so it's a wide spanning list from kind of quantum to biotech to trusted AI. Um, as we kind of reflect on the potential gaps between where the US, what the US kind of has today to deter China and what it, it needs to, what do you think those kind of short-term technological big bets should really be? Well, I like to focus on, you know, start with what are the operational problems that we have to solve to be effective in deterring and if necessary, defeating Chinese aggression. Um, and so I would start first and foremost with how do we build a resilient, self-healing network of networks that give us robust man control communications, you know, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, C4ISR, um, in a contested environment, meaning an environment where we're going to have electronic warfare, cyber attacks, all kinds of uh, kinetic attacks on our systems, and yet the network of networks is able, like an electrical grid, to reroute traffic and keep the lights on, basically, for our commanders in the field. Um, so that's priority number one. So every every technology that can enable that um, is should be high on the list. I think a second um, near-term opportunity, as I've suggested before, is um, opportunities for human-machine teaming. And that is, you know, a lot of people talk, kind of create a false um, trade-off, I think, between, you know, we're either going to divest of all of our legacy systems and create all these new capabilities, you know, we're going to do one or the other. And the answer is that's wrong. It's, we are going to have a largely legacy force for this foreseeable future. 
That's just a fact. The, the challenge is and the opportunity is how do you marry that those platforms with new technologies and capabilities, some defense, some commercial, um, that are emerging, um, that gives them meaningfully different uh, capabilities. It, it, maybe it buys back range. Maybe it allows us to hold parts of the Chinese force at risk that we couldn't hold at risk before. But in that regard, I think very mature defense technologies that are already coming online and commercial technologies that are available off the shelf, particularly um, unmanned systems that can be operated by a manned platform. Because one of the biggest problems we have fighting in China, you know, just trying to deter or fight in China's backyard is they will always have the quantitative advantage. And so uh, leveraging tradable systems that can buy us some greater mass um, in the near term uh, and really complicate their lives, uh, the adversaries, you know, chances of success. I think the, the, those are both two examples and obviously not the whole list, but two examples of priority areas where we could make some significant prob progress in the near term if we focused on it. Thank you. So um, if we, if, if 2027 is kind of the pacing marker, you know, right now we're going through um, the process of, you know, congressional, preparing for congressional budget markups. Um, so w what do we need to seed in terms of potential language into the 2024 budget markups so that certain capabilities are budgeted for for 2025? I would like to see, number one, someone put in charge of this effort in this interim period. As I mentioned before, you know, the the service chiefs have the 2030 and beyond perspective. The COCOM has the next two or three years perspective. There's no one focused on this problem every day, accountable to the secretary every day for making progress in this area. So authorize someone to be in charge. Um, Congress needs to give the department some flexibility for greater flexibility for re reprogramming resources to get after some of these urgent shortfalls. One example, munition stocks. You know, anytime there's any kind of budget pressure, the services will cut munitions buys in order to preserve keeping more plat new platforms in the budget. Um, that is going to put us in a world of hurt if it comes to actually having to deter or respond to China's, uh, China. Um, and so restocking our munitions, prepositioning, um, making sure any posture changes that are needed to set the theater we really need to be focused on setting the theater for deterrence in that time frame, And um, I would love to see Congress give the department both flexibility to move money to do that and also some additional funding to support that. I think that's a, a very helpful laundry list of things for the administration to, to be considering, for Congress to be considering. Um, I'm going to turn to a couple of audience questions here. We, we've received some really, really um, great ones, so please keep them coming. And um, we have a question from uh, Lieutenant General Michael Groen um, here. Uh, he is a, he's a kind of distinguished fellow with the Atlantic Council. Um, he says, we are watching as Ukrainian soldiers destroy Russian armored formations with precision shoulder launch to munitions. And we've seen how unmanned systems can provide small big kills. What do these battlefield trends imply for US defense capabilities and investments going forward? So I think we need to um, replenish our own stocks of those systems and certainly expand some uh, our stocks of some of the UAV systems, which frankly, we don't have in number in our force. Um, uh, one of this, there's a real industrial based challenge here. Um, some of the, for example, the Stinger line, the Javelin line, I mean, some of these really critical weapon systems are no longer in active production. And so we've got to figure out you know, do we how do, you know? Do we try to fund the reopening of those? Do we try to bring forward the next generation that we're investing in for the future? How do we replenish those systems um, that we've rightly given to Ukraine, but it's very important for us to replenish our own stocks as well? And oh, by the way, have enough to share with a country like Taiwan. Um, so I do think this some seeing some of the Ukrainian success with integrating some of these systems 
um, into their operations and allowing them to be very successful. I'm hoping that you know planners across the services are taking looking at some of those lessons and saying, okay, how do we apply that? Whether it's in the European theater in a future situation or the Asia Pacific Indo Pacific theater in a very different situation vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. But I'm hoping that we are we are taking some of those lessons and starting to experiment with new concepts enabled by those technologies. Yeah. Um, so we, ha we have another great question here. I think it's a, a very fair point that's being raised um, by Michael Spertus, um, who, who's from RAND. Um, he highlights that the scale of US military aid to Ukraine is, is very large. It's 18 to $25 billion has been spent. Whereas in comparison, the State Department has um, proposed selling 1.1 billion um, to Taiwan. Um, even if, oh, and a, another initiative that calls for 6.5 billion, but that, that's dwarfed by what has been um, kind of uh, given to support Ukraine. So he asks, even if both of those initiatives come to fruition, they are just a fraction of what would likely be required to successfully arm Taiwan. How can we incentivize Congress and the Pentagon to take the steps necessary to aid Taiwan? I think one of the things that would really help build congressional support for additional assistance and frankly build support in trying to get other allies uh, to contribute is a very compelling concept, uh, like a really a, 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 fuls a fulsome concept of here's what asymmetric layer defense looks like and, and this is what we think would, would give Taiwan the ability to meaningfully contribute to deterrence and also by time should that deterrent fail. Um, and, and sort of have a, a holistic uh, approach into which the each is fit. I think if that, if, if that um, broader picture were in place and each of the requests kind of made sense as how it would contribute, that would go a long way. I do want to give credit to the department. They've been spending a lot of time going up to the Hill, showing the members classified war games of what a China-Taiwan conflict could look like um, to try to create some sense of urgency and some sense of, you know, we need to lean forward into this deterrence challenge. Um, and so they've been setting, kind of setting the, uh, the, the table for this. Um, now I think we, I think we need to help the Taiwanese come up with a compelling concept that could then be resourced in a in a comprehensive and coherent uh, way, not just by the U.S. but by the Taiwanese themselves, and then uh, other allies and partners who might want to contribute. Okay. Um, it's speaking of, of um, Congress, we we have a question here from Russell Brooks um, from the House of Representatives. He asks, regarding budgets, is it time to provide unequal funding to the services? The Indo-Pacific is a maritime theater, so should we emphasize funding to the Navy and the Marines to counter the pacing threat from China? You know, I, I, um, I agree with the, the premise is we shouldn't be dividing the pie a third, a third, and a third, or a quarter, 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 and now with the Space Force, you know, what the new fraction we need to be funding services based on the capabilities they bring to get there against the specific challenges that we face. And obviously in the Indo-Pacific, um, it, it, it is a maritime theater where um, air and naval forces will be predominant. Doesn't mean that ground forces will be irrelevant, but they will, they will play relatively less of a role. However, as Russia has reminded us, we need to also invest in making sure that we can deter and respond to aggression in the European theater where ground forces have a very substantial role to play. So we've got to, to focus on a balance. I don't think the answer is coming up with an arbitrary fraction. It really is deriving the budget and the resource allocation from the operational needs um, of deterrence and, and defeating aggression in these theaters. Um, we have a lot of audience questions here, so I'm, I'm going to try and get through as many as quickly as possible. Um, so we have a question from uh, Matt Kranig, who's the acting director of the Scowcroft Center here at the Atlanta Council. 
Um, he says, you've now famously said uh, that to deter China, we need the ability to sink the Chinese Navy in 72 hours. Is that the right standard? Can you uh, elaborate on, on how best we can reach that goal? Not exactly what I said, but <laughs> what I said is, you know, I was making the point that we want to have a number of arrows in our quiver so that if we really think that Xi Jinping is contemplating aggression against Taiwan unprovoked, that um, we have another of options to give him pause. One of those options would be to be able to truthfully say, are you sure you want to do this? We do have the capacity by putting long range precision, precision strike munitions on our strategic bombers who can stand off, you know, to actually hold at risk any ships in your fleet that are coming across to Taiwan. And so you know, basically, are you willing to lose, potentially lose your neighbor, na Navy and then, or a good portion of your Navy in the next three days for the sake of attacking Taiwan? It's really you know, a way of introducing uh, risk into his calculus and causing him to decide, well, maybe, maybe not today. Um, and so it was just one example um, that came out of a particular experiment where the Strategic Capabilities Office put Navy munitions, so called the RASMs, on Air Force bombers um, and, and showed that you could dramatically improve our capability to hold um, Chinese naval forces at risk. Now, the interesting follow-on to that is, okay, well, that's that's exciting. That's an interesting. Maybe we want that quiver in our or our you know tool in our toolkit. Um, so, unfortunately, not you know the the Navy and the Air Force are going like this, and nobody's actually funded the purchase of the necessary munitions, nor the necessary modifications to the aircraft, nor the exercising of the capability. So it remains theoretically possible, but it's not actually being funded and fielded as a ready capability. So, but it's just one example, it's not a magic bullet. It is one example of the kind of thinking that I'm talking about. You take two, a Navy munition, an Air Force platform, you put it in together in a new way, you get a different result. That's the kind of thinking and experimentation we need to be doing urgently to meaningfully enhance deterrence. Mm -hmm. And just because you're raising this, and, and I've not yet asked you about the administration's new concept of integrated deterrence, which is you know, meant to be kind of getting at some of this, of, of how do we integrate kind of all tools of US national power um, to really improve our deterrence posture and, and to do so with allies and partners. I, I'd love to hear you kind of reflect on, on what you think kind of the opportunity for integrated deterrence could be. I mean, it, it's, it's a large concept and I think in some ways, some folks have asked, how is that different <laughs> from the way we've been approaching deterrence in the past? Um, so I'd love to, love to hear you reflect on that. Yeah, no, I think integrated deterrence is the right idea. And I, and I think, frankly, you know, the, 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 the focus of the national defense strategy, although we haven't seen the full unclassified document yet, it is absolutely in the right direction. So, you know, integrated deterrence talks about integrating all instruments of national power, integrating allies, um, integrating, making sure that we can deter across domains, whether it's undersea, on the sea, on land, in the air, in space, in cyberspace. So conceptually, it's absolutely the right way to go. I think the, the challenge is now, how do you implement that in a way um, that is relevant to the timelines we're facing and to the challenges that we're facing? And that's really where the rubber meets the road is, you know, how do you meaningfully enhance deterrence in this time frame? Um, I think another key element of, of this is the whole question of conceal and reveal. Um, you know, we are a very open book as a transparent democracy, which is generally a good thing, but it also means that, you know, potential adversaries and competitors are very aware of what's in our defense budget. They watch our experiments, they watch our ex exercises, they watch our training. They have a pretty good flavor of, of sense of what we're, we're capable of. But there are some things that we've managed to keep 
secret or quiet. Um, there are things that are in development that have not been revealed. But I think a strategic approach that says, of the things that they don't know that we have, when and how should we reveal those to get the maximum deterrent effect and to create maximum doubt and loss of confidence on the part of Chinese decision makers? I think that is, it's a strategic question that needs to be part of the strategy as well. And um, so a, a lot of what we were uh, kind of talking about and, and would really need to be kind of preparing for is, is joint warfare. Um, and it, joint warfare is, it's hard <laughs> until you are really tested and, and, and try to, to integrate your forces in certain ways. It, it's, um, we don't have tons of good examples of truly testing uh, integration of, of our joint force. So what can we do? You mentioned experimentation, um, the need for kind of creative thinking, maybe novel operational concepts. What can we be doing through operational experimentation and simulations and things today to really test a truly kind of joint combined and multi-domain um, type of warfare? Yeah. Well, um, again, I, 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 I applaud the department, um, particularly the deputy secretaries put together a experimentation program um, to encourage this kind of work. Um, the problem is that for things that are, you know, for people who are applying now with concepts, um, the money doesn't come until 2024, just because of the slowness of the departmental budgeting problem process. So I, what I think is more of a, I think we need to be more on an emergency footing. Um, you know, you think about the kind of experimentation that the Navy did with carrier-based aviation in the run-up to World War II. Big Navy didn't like it. Big Navy still thought the name of the game was battleships, um, but they tolerated it. And they let some really smart, some of their best people spend time on figuring out what carrier aviation would look like and how it could contribute. And thank God they did. So I think what I'd like to see within each of the services is not only toleration, but a real resourcing and protection of taking some of their best and brightest, putting them in a room and saying, here are some of the tools you can deal with. Here are the you know, available tools you can deal with. Here are the operational problems you're trying to solve. And the only requirement is you do it in a way that breaks current doctrine and, and see what they come up with and really reward and incentivize that behavior See and you know have the services bring some of that work forward, and then start experimenting. Obviously, first at the service level, and then at a joint level, to see which of these concepts really works. What could be matured and brought into um, reality um, within the next you know five to seven years. That's the kind of urgent work that is is critical. So um, we've got a number more audience questions. Uh, we have a question here from Harlan Ullman, who's a senior advisor here at the Atlantic Council. And he reflects on kind of the, uh, the number of war games that have, have taken place really at kind of assessing a, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Um, and he says, China has many alternative routes of attack beyond just an amphibious assault by sea. Um, including seizing small islands, leveraging its economic power, cyber attacks. He asked, why are U.S. defense planners focusing on a conventional attack scenario, which could easily be prevented through a porcupine defense of Taiwan and far less on alternative unconventional forms of attacks by China? Uh, it's a really good point. We need to look at a range of scenarios because invasion may not be the preferred scenario. It may be blockade, it may be seizing islands, it may be other gray zone tactics um, that would be more difficult for us to uh, deal with um, unless we really put our you know, minds to it now. And so I, I think you're, you're, what you're raising a really important cautionary point that we don't want to prepare for one, a point solution for one scenario. We need to look at the range of possibilities of how Chinese, China could um, coerce Taiwan um, and, uh, and really prepare for the broad range. And that will include, you know, a whole of government, it has to include a whole of government approach because a lot of the response options, a lot of the critical uh, instruments will not be military in nature. Um, so a really, really important point to keep in mind. 
We have um, a question here from Douglas Carr from the National Review, and he says, legacy Navy ships are likely not ideally suited to a Taiwan battle, but by 2027, they're all we've got. Um, should we spend more defense money to maintain the present fleet numbers or focus on building an advanced force more tailored to a Taiwan contingency? This is the key question. And the truth is we do need to evolve the fleet for the future, but in the meantime, recognize, as you say, that if this happens in 2027, we go, you know, go to war with the force that we have, the famous Rumsfeld. <laughs> um, and, and so there, therefore, that's why I'm so focused on, okay, take those platforms. What are the additional capabilities you can put on them? What are the, how, how do we operate them in new ways, operate across joint uh, you know, service lines to have you know, leverage capabilities in a more joint configuration to get a meaningfully different, different result? That, that is the, the challenge. Um, and so um, in the near term, it's about you know, uh, adopting those additional, integrating those additional capabilities and adopting new concepts. In the longer term, it is a, about evolving the capabilities of the, the force of the future, because that does, we obviously need, need, need a more robust force uh, for the more contested environments in the future. But these are very tough trade-off decisions, and this is exactly where the budget fights are happening, of how do exactly do you make those trade-offs? Yeah. Um, so I've not yet asked you any nuclear questions, um, and I'd be remiss not to. We've had a, a couple of audience questions along these lines, but I, I might take uh, moderator's uh, kind of ability to ask you, you, you one myself. So China has really embarked on an unpre unprecedented buildup of, it, of its nuclear arsenal, um, and it also seems to be making pretty significant shifts to its nuclear strategy. And obviously, the, the US's nuclear posture has really been focused on bipolarity with Russia for a long time. So, so this reality of, of perhaps nuclear tripolarity dealing with Russia and China as nuclear threats um, at the same time, you know, how, how can we, what are the challenges that tripolarity poses that, that bipolarity doesn't? And, and how do we set ourselves up, especially as the US is thinking about its nuclear nuclear posture um, to be able to deter um, two significant adversaries with, with growing nuclear arsenals and capabilities? So I think the, the challenge is we now need to not only be, have a sufficient deterrent to deter Russia, but also to deter China. Um, I, many people have raised the possibility of trilateral arms control. I do not think that is in the cards because I don't think China sees itself as a, a nuclear power that's reached parity. And so they, they, I don't think they have any interest in arms control or mutual constraints at this point. Um, and any constraints that we accept with Russia, we have to also view in the context of what does it mean for our deterrence vis-a-vis -vis China. So it definitely is a, it makes the calculus of what, of what is enough, what's adequate as a deterrent, for us, much, it makes it much more com a more complex, multivariable um, equation. Um, it also means that we have to really uh, think about how we reassure our allies that in this context, um, that uh, extended deterrence is still viable, um, and so that they don't have to go nuclear themselves. Um, and this, this is also uh, true because of North Korea's uh, aspiration and, and we think nearing the capability of being able to mate a nuclear warhead to an intercontinental ballistic missile. So the nuclear um, arena is really very dynamic at the moment and it is changing in ways that are unprecedented. And I think there's a lot of fresh conceptual work for places like the Atlantic Council to do <laughs> to help planners at Stratcom and elsewhere sort of think through these, these challenges, particularly when you have to nuclear competitors who are really not interested in, um, have a very different approach doctrinally and are not interested in arms control or constraint or risk reduction at the moment. So we are fast running out of time, but I, I did want to really, so we've spent a lot of today's conversation talking about deterring China, but the reality is 
you know, the US faces a strategic simultaneity pro problem, as, as some people have coined it. You know, the having to position itself in terms of capability development, force posture, working with allies and partners to deter two adversaries, you know, potentially at the same and, and to potentially fight them at the same time. So all of that I think behooves probably a need for more of a reliance on our allies and partners to be able to balance balance that, uh, the threats that we face. So where can allies complement US efforts and, and where are there potentially glaring capability, uh, not capability gaps, maybe capability gaps, but glaring gaps where our allies can plug in? And, and one thing, I mean, you know, we're waiting for the, uh, the public um, release of the national security strategy, the national defense strategy. Those are two big strategic documents that not only our adversaries, but our allies look at to understand where US defense planning is going. Um, are there ways that we could be thinking about, um, about doing really total defense planning with our allies and partners in a different way, given they have a stake um, in, the in, in their own security, in the security of the Indo-Pacific and Europe. And, and the reality is, is that the US cannot do everything on its own all at once. And so, so do you have any kind of wisdom for us of, of how we should be approaching that strategic simultaneity problem um, and uh, you know, integrating allies and partners more effectively into our defense planning? Well, first of all, I, I think the strategy is right to think about deterrence in more than re one region as a t at a time. We are a global power with global interests, um, and we've got to be able to deter aggression in more than one place at one time. Um, I do think allies are critical. Um, in Europe, we have the most developed alliance structure with NATO, I think the Russia's uh, aggression against Ukraine has ironically produced more alliance cohesion and determination and political commitment to spend more on defense than anything we've seen in, a, in years. Um, so Putin has succeeded in galvanizing NATO and, and the NATO member states. And so I think that presents a new opportunity to, for the alliance to come together and do some shared planning to say, okay, given the additional resources that are about to be committed, how do we get the most out of every single dollar that is spent? Um, how do we get, you know, make sure that the sum of what NATO has as an alliance is greater than the parts? Um, and I think that means a lot of um, transparency, coordination, shared planning, and, and a little bit of a division of labor in, in that not everybody has to have every capability in equal measure. There are some countries that are going to do better off, you know, specializing in certain areas, not specializing, but, you know, really focusing on what they can contribute in some areas and, and others will focus in other areas. And collectively, we can stitch that together into something that's stronger as NATO. So I, I think that NATO has a huge opportunity here um, going forward. Um, in Asia, it's different. We don't have a NATO structure, nor do I think we ever will. It's really a hub and spoke system of bilateral um, alliances and partnerships. And so first and foremost, the contributions of, of basing and, and whether it's whether it's permanent basing or more likely occasional visits, you know, places where the US forces can visit, where we can stockpile, where we can preposition, where we can exercise, that's really, really important to our posture. Um, and then looking on a bilateral basis of where can they invest in capabilities that really contribute not only to their own national defense, but also their ability to contribute to collective defense should you know, a Taiwan scenario or something else arise. And I think those are exactly the conversations that are happening with Australia, with Japan, with Korea, um, and, and other partners in the region. Um, so, um, they, I mean, we can't, we can't succeed without our allies is the bottom line but it's a source of tremendous strategic advantage. Mm. Now is the time to kind of bring them inside the tent and really be very collaborative in our planning um, for how we're going to make sure we get the most out of our defense spending. So to close us out, I, I did want to give you the opportunity to, to provide any kind of concluding thoughts that, that you have. We have a lot of, um, then the policymaking community and, and folks in, in the media and, and from Congress 
tuning into this event. So if you were to leave our audience with any kind of one passing thought or priority for what we can be doing in the near term to enhance the United States' deterrence, uh, uh, what, what would you leave our audience with? No, I think um, this is a time where we need to try to transcend some of, some of our political polarization and realize that this is true, truly a national security moment. It is a moment where, you know, decades from now, we'll look back and see that the tectonic plates of geopolitics were shifting underneath us and the world is realigning. Um, it is a moment where um, if we want to deter uh, a conflict that is, you know, the most likely candidate for becoming World War III, we need to make are some different investments now. Um, and we need to transcend our politics to make sure that we enable our, you know, we, 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 we have a very strong hand, a better hand than China, but we need to be allowed to play it as best we can to get to um, the deterrence outcome that we're looking for. Because no one wants a war with China. It would be devastating for all concerned, even the winners. Um, and certainly for the global economy, and for the security and prosperity of Americans and, and, and our friends and allies. So the stakes are really, really high. Um, and it's just a moment where we really need um, some transcendent leadership to, to focus on what needs to be done to prevent a conflict of this nature. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Florano, for joining us. It, it, this has been a really enlightening um, conversation. Thank you so much to our audience for joining us as well and the terrific questions um, that you submitted. To our partners, Lockheed Martin, for really making this event and this event series possible. And just looking forward to welcoming um, you all back for our future um, Forward Defense Forum series. Thank you so much.